Okay. Uh, today we're in week three of the sermon series on Paul's letter to the Galatians. This is one of the very first documents ever written about the early church. And within the letter we see immediately the sorts of problems that faced the early Christian leaders as they sought to establish local communities of believers. In our first two messages we saw how Paul had been told of some Jewish Christians that were following him and speaking to the churches. The churches that he himself had established among the Gentile or non-Jewish communities in Cappadocia and Galatia, an area that we would call southern and central Turkey today. These Judaizers were telling the Gentile converts that simple faith in Jesus was not enough to be saved. If you really wanted to be saved, you had to become Jews. Now for men, this had serious and very painful implications. Yeah. Okay? <coughs> for families, that meant trying to figure out all the complex and utterly inexplicable rules of eating kosher. Now, having lived in the country, in the land, for 15 days, trust me, if you can figure out kosher, you're better than I am. It is crazy difficult. Also, they had to uh, obey the laws of clean and unclean. And that's another minefield. And all of the added burden that adherence to the Jewish law requires. Now, at first read, this passage that... Uh, Faye read for us so well, it looks like a straightforward trip report, doesn't it? But we need to take a closer look. Paul doesn't do anything straightforward. There's layers within layers within layers. When we take a closer look at the passage, there are some very interesting reflections that Paul makes about his trip to Jerusalem. Now, if you want a fully detailed account of what we call the Jerusalem Council, Luke records the whole thing in great detail in Acts chapter 15. The whole chapter is devoted to this meeting <coughs> Excuse me, that Paul's talking about. So let's have a look at our passage. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Paul writes that it was after 14 years of ministry that he was going up to Jerusalem. The first question is, why now? Why? What's 14 got to do with anything, 14 years? The answer is in verse 2. Paul went as a direct result of a revelation from Jesus that he needed to set things straight with the Jerusalem apostles. You might remember that Paul received his gospel as a direct revelation from Jesus himself. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to check in with the other apostles to see if his gospel was in line with theirs. No, no, no. That's not why he went. Paul was going to Jerusalem to see if their understanding on how to live out the gospel was in line with his. He knew they preached the same gospel because they received it from the same source as Paul, the Lord Jesus himself. He wanted to make sure that they were not adding more rules to, from the Jewish law into the gospel of salvation. He was pretty tricky actually in how he did this. There's a little clue there in verse 1 and also took Titus with me. Sounds so innocent, doesn't it? 
This sounds like Paul took Titus to Jerusalem because it would be a nice experience for him. Maybe to round out his education. No, no, no. Paul took Titus to Jerusalem because he was a Greek Christian, an uncircumcised Gentile Christian. The presence of Titus with Paul and Barnabas was for a very good reason. To see if the Jerusalem apostles would accept Titus as an uncircumcised, fully saved, non-Jewish Christian. And the result, well, we see that in verse 3. Galatians 2.3 says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. <coughs> So they passed that test, didn't they? So why did Paul meet privately with the senior apostolic leadership to explain his gospel to them? Was it to get their approval for his mission to the Gentiles? No, no, no. Not at all. Paul wanted to make sure that the gospel and the way they applied the gospel in their own lives that the message that the leaders of the church was preaching was in line with his gospel. Sounds arrogant, doesn't it? He got 14 years of ministry to the Gentiles. The only preacher in the world ministering to non-Jews at that time. It was all on the line. Remember, Paul said right at the beginning of Galatians that there is only one gospel. So let's see if the Jerusalem leadership accept Paul as an equal. As he continues in verse 2, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. The issue here, as we see unfolding in the next couple of verses, is that certain factions within the Jerusalem church have been sending out Judaizing missionaries to follow after Paul. Their job was to convert the Gentile Christians into Jews and bring them back under the law. Some of these people had even snuck into the meeting to see how it would all work out. As Paul said, lest by any means I might run or have had run in vain. Was Paul worried that his message might have been wrong? No way. He knew his message was right. He got, he got it directly from Jesus. Not at all. He was worried that these Judaizers might have had apostolic authority. That was why he was in Jerusalem. Did these people who were following him have the authority of the Jerusalem apostles to back them up? That's why he's down in Jerusalem. If the other apostles did not confirm his message and renounce the false teachers, it would be very hard for him to retain his converts. False teachers were telling these young Christians that Paul was preaching a gospel that was inadequate and not as full as the original apostolic gospel preached by the Jerusalem leaders. He was worried that if these false teachers had been sent out by the apostles, then all his work for the past 14 years would have been stifled and fruitless in the face of overwhelming authority of the likes of Peter and James. Those guys. If they did not come out and denounce these false teachers that were using their names to validate their false teaching there was going to be trouble. Verse 4. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought, secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy at our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. So some of these guys actually snuck into this private meeting and started having it out with Paul. 
And I reckon it was pretty lively. <laughs> From the language Paul used right there in chapter 1, he doesn't mince his words, does he? So we ended up with a ruling by the Jerusalem Council concerning the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles. And from Acts chapter 15, verses 23 to 27, I'm going to read it to you. This is a letter that the apostles wrote to the, to the Gentile Christians. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some of you went out from since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men with you, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things, by word of mouth. Well, there you go. All good. That's a stunning letter. And, of course, they're sending out two of the brethren with Barnabas and, and, and Paul to take that letter to all the churches in those areas. Just so that no one is supposed to stop these Judaizing Christians in their tracks straight away. Now most religions of the world are salvation by works. Alright? You must pray, you must fast, you must give alms and so on. And then at the end of it all you'll get right with God. I don't have to name those religions do I? I think we've got, all got a pretty fair idea. You'll get right with God and you'll save yourself by your own efforts. And do-it-yourself religion does appeal to people because it leaves them with their pride. If I achieved it, it is self-righteousness. But God hates self-righteousness. Jesus just couldn't get on with self-righteous people, could he? He was a friend of sinners. But the self-righteous, the Pharisees, he couldn't get on with at all. So is salvation by works alone? Do you really have to do your best and really work hard to get there? Or is salvation works plus faith? This is very common. You see, works plus faith says do as many of the Ten Commandments as you can and then have faith for what you don't manage. Keep as many as commandments as you can and then ask God to forgive you what you don't manage to keep. That's a pretty common understanding of Christianity in Australia. Then there are, are, are those who say, no, no, it's not works plus faith, it's faith plus works. Well, what does that look like? That is what Paul was up against in Galatia. You start with faith. <coughs> faith, I don't know what's going wrong here. You start with faith and then you go into works. And you keep the law after you've believed. But you've got to keep the law. You see, that's what the Judaizers were saying. Start with faith and then keep the law. And that's why Paul was going to say to the Galatians a little late, later in the letter, How foolish can you be after starting your new lives in the Spirit 
Are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Really? Because the law belongs to human effort. That's your effort. It's not the spirit doing it in you. It's you doing it. And what Paul was fighting for was faith alone. Faith from first to last, as he often puts it. Faith from beginning to end, he said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God that saves everyone who goes on believing. For it is from faith to faith, faith from first to last, as the NIV puts it. In other words, we cannot compromise on this. You go on believing. That's the heart of it. You don't believe at the beginning and then work for it. You go on believing. And there's a big difference between telling people they need to go on believing and telling them they need to keep the law now. There's a huge difference. So this is the real reason. This is the real issue that Paul was fighting. What he's fighting for is Christian freedom. He's fighting for freedom. Our freedom. The freedom that we enjoy today. This is what was going on at that meeting. This was the meeting that chose freedom for all Christians, no matter what part of the world they come from, no matter what culture they grew up in. Freedom. To introduce the law at any stage is to put them back under the curse. Because the only pass mark that Jesus will accept for the law is 100%. You either keep it all or you've broken the law. It's like three people stranded on a rock with the incoming tide and there's a three metre deep bit of sea now between the rock and the sand. And the first man jumped and he only managed to jump a third of the way and he drowned. The second man was a better jumper and he managed two thirds of the way and he drowned. The third man only missed by six inches, but he was lost as well. If if you don't make the jump, if you can't keep the law 100%, then you're lost. That's why it's such a terrible burden. That's why no one can keep it. That's why we need salvation in Jesus. The gospel has a different way of righteousness altogether. How does the gospel give freedom? Well, first the gospel leads to cultural freedom. You know, traditional religion tends to press its members to adopt a very specific set of rules and regulations for dress and daily behaviour. I'm sure we've all been there. Why? Well, if your salvation depends on obeying the rules then you want your rules to be very specific, doable and clear. You don't want love your neighbour as yourself because that's an impossibly high standard, isn't it? And that has all sorts of implications because you can't keep it all the time. So you want things like don't go to movies, don't drink alcohol, don't eat this type of food. Always use the old King James Bible. Do I need to keep going? You see what I mean? You put in a set of rules that you can keep. But what are you doing? You're putting people back under bondage. Anyone who believes that our relationship with God is based on keeping up moral behaviour like the Ten Commandments is on an endless treadmill of guilt and insecurity. As we know from Paul's letters, he did not free Gentile believers from the moral imperatives of the Ten Commandments. Christians couldn't lie, steal, commit adultery and so on. But through, but though not free from the moral law as a way to live, Christians are free from it as a system of salvation. Whereby not in the fear and insecurity of hoping to earn our salvation, but in the freedom of security of knowing we are already saved in Christ. We obey these Ten Commandments 
in the freedom of gratitude because we love Jesus. Not because we have to do that to be saved, but because we love Jesus. That's how we behave. So both false teachers and Paul told Christians to obey the Ten Commandments, but for totally different reasons and motives. And unless your motive for obeying God's law is the grace gratitude motive of the gospel, you're in slavery. The gospel provides freedom, both culturally and emotionally. The other gospel destroys both. As we will read a little later in the letter, Paul sums up the whole issue with this verse. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.